So hello and uh, welcome to our webinar, the Money Magpie webinar, where we're looking, are we facing a global financial reset and how can you protect your money? Now, today we have on the panel Cameron Parry, who's founder of Tally Money, a savings product that is based on gold. Uh, we have Gordon Kerr, who's a former banker and CEO of Cobden Partners. Uh, we also have Chris Lewis, who's standing in for Jason Noble, um, both of them in one place.com. And last but not least, definitely, and I'm hoping he can join us, is George Ma, who's a member of the Faculty and Institute of Actuaries and author of this book, Pugnare, which looks at the financial and economic history of the Roman Empire and frankly, what it teaches us about our economics and finance uh, today. So, and we also have all you lovely um, attendees. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, and, when, and I'm looking forward to hearing from you too. If you have any questions, put them in the, uh, the chat or you know, put up your hand, real or virtual, and um, we'll come to you. And um, the lovely Izzy is, is keeping an eye on everyone. So she'll let me know if somebody has their hand up. I've set up this webinar because I feel that we are on the brink of a huge change, a financial reset, not necessarily a great reset. It depends on how we all behave, frankly, I think, and what we allow our leaders to do, because we seem to be at the start of a decade that mirrors the 1970s with bells on. Rampant inflation, potential stagflation, strikes, the possibility of a serious recession, and on top of all that, Interest rates that are so low, there's nowhere they can go lower, really, but they can't go much higher either without destroying people's lives, frankly. Now, back in the 70s, there wasn't the money printing, but we've been doing money printing on steroids now. So, well, so let's, uh, let's see what everybody thinks is going to happen this decade. And I'm going to start with Gordon Kerr from Cobden Partners, because I know that you talk about this a lot, Gordon, at this subject. What do you think we have in store in the next few years? Is it some sort of financial reset? Uh, thank you, Jasmine. Yeah, I mean, it's true to say, just by way of background, I, I set up Cobden Partners about 11 years ago, thinking that there would be some appetite among small countries on the fringe of the Eurozone, such as Iceland, for example, um, who obviously experienced a particularly severe crisis around about 2008 to 10, to just deflect somewhat from the global so-called Basel banking rules. It, you know, discussions of technical accounting uh, rules and banking regulations are very kind of pithy, boring. They don't capture the zeitgeist at all. And it's interesting that nobody ever talks about it. The, the, the narrative that's been spun by the, the most powerful central banks in Western Europe, the ECB and the Bank of England, that somehow banks have been kind of recapitalized. They've, they've cured their their, uh, their bad behaviour, the, the bad loans have been flushed out of the system, I believe is entirely false. And this is the fundamental root of the kind of reset discussions that uh, the, is the subject of tonight's um, webinar. Specifically, you know, three or four years after I set up Cobden Partners, around about 2012 to 15, we had a, a series of high profile. Derek, could you mark mute yourself, please? Thank you. Um, Derek, you need, you need to mute yourself. I can't mute you. Please, 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 Derek, please. So nothing is certain in the way it has been on previous occasions. Any permutation does. Derek, can you? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sorry, Gordon. Carry on. Okay. Um, now my thinking changed around about 2012 to 15, 15 in particular, when many of you will remember the uh, possible expulsion or withdrawal of Greece from the Eurozone. So great were their problems. They went through three or four bailout programs within three years. Um, and the solution to all of this, of course, was ECB central bank money printing. I tend to focus more in Europe and the Eurozone than on the UK, but it's very difficult to see much of a distinction between the two. The parallel I would draw for everybody's attention is the history of the Soviet era uh, financing system. You refer to the Roman era. I think that's a little bit too distant to be directly par parallel for us. But what's most interesting is, of course, that the Soviet system of central banking and commercial banking was, was really one with just different labels. 
it operated on two levels. There was a kind of cash system where cash was carefully controlled and the broad approach towards managing the economy was summarized by, but in the great book, 800 pages written in the eighties by Hungarian Janos Koinoi called the economics of shortage. Effectively, they just authorized, for example, the bread manufacturers, bakers to break, to bake 70% of the bread requirements of every little village in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, thus generating huge shortages. The effect of this was also to keep prices down. Inflation was viewed by the Soviets as an evil capitalist trait, but, but this system kind of survived for 75 years in the Soviet Union. My terrible. 45 years in, uh, in, uh, in Eastern Europe. Of course, there was nobody alive when the Soviet system collapsed. The, the money system collapsed in hyperinflation in 1989-90. Nobody alive in the Soviet Union who'd been adults when this incepted back in the 1920s. But in Eastern Europe, there was. And one guy in particular, Leszek Balcerowicz, who became the finance minister of Poland, was responsible for designing the transition from, from Soviet era monobanking approach to the Western system of capitalism. In a nutshell, I believe that the way that the Euro system is working at present is remarkably similar to the way the, the Soviet era uh, approached this with, with di diverting so much of the money creation to its own system of commercial and central banks that are intrinsically yeah. And so, this cannot go on forever. No, so so you're particularly talking about the euro there, but but um, Cameron, I'll bring you in here. Do you feel that what um, Gordon has been talking about is the same across the globe? Well, I mean, it, across the Western world, you know, with the money printing in, in America, money printing here, as well as the euro. Uh, yes. Um, <clears throat> Yes, generally, I mean, we for the last 50 years, nothing's been pegged to anything uh, physical like gold uh, in the fiat currency fractional reserve banking system. Uh, when, the, when the US in 71 closed the gold window uh, because they had written too many notes. I mean, a bank note of cash is just a note. It's like writing a check from a government. And um, it used to be exchanged for a commodity, which would give it, give it value because of that. Um, and uh, you can exchange I'm in a it. Zoom so, meeting now. Um, and you could, Apologies. Uh, not at all. You, anyway, you could exchange it for that. And um, but in '71, uh, it was becoming apparent that the US had overspent uh, with the Vietnam War and all the rest of it. So they'd written far too many greenbacks, far too many paper money checks, if you like, um, to uh, than the gold they had. Which is why, and this is. You know, and what Gordon's sort of talking about, you know, everything's very cyclical. I mean, some things happen in cycles of months or years. Um, you know, economic cycles used to be seven years uh, until central banks get involved. And then they, they try to get you to avoid a recession, which is kind of a silly thing to avoid. Um, booms are good. Recessions are good. The bits in the middle are good. You know, there's, there's a transference of wealth that naturally goes on depending on how you... Uh, run your business or how you behave in a, in a certain period of the economy. Um, but, uh, you know, there are much larger cycles, population growth cycles, like we're in population decline now, which will affect, you know, have a negative effect on, um, on, on growth globally. Um, and, and there are, you know, as they say, uh, you know, like uh, history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, which I never quite like that term, but there is an echo to it. It won't be exactly like that, but there'll be, you can really learn from it. And some of these cycles are like, um, you know, they're hundred year cycles um, where there's a, where there's a superpower, if you like, that has the military might and the industry to, to have the, the global currency. And we see that with the U S so uh, at the moment, and it's been like that since 45, when the European nations were pretty broke from fighting world war two and America's economy was thriving uh, through, um, you know, through industry and whatnot. Um, but, but, you know, it's folly to think the American dollar will be, will be the global currency forever. It might have been forever in our lifetimes, but if you go back a bit further, this is the case, whether it's the pound or, you know, the Ottoman Empire or, um, or whatever, these things are kind of constantly changing. And what's a little bit, I think, scary for people at the moment is we're going, maybe there's an end game coming again. So the, the monetary system was reset 50 years ago. Like this, this tends to happen every few decades. Mm. We're getting to the point where um, it, it'll probably happen again. It worries me a great deal that um, 
we're getting so you know pumped full of crises everywhere everything's a crisis now that that to get the to get the changes that we will need to swallow as the public and that is the devaluation of our property and our money in particular or at least the government issue money won't happen to you if you have tally um, but on that money on the fiat currency um, you know and it'll be a crisis you won't be able to use your banking facilities tomorrow if you don't just agree and swallow that everything should be devalued by 40 percent overnight Daddy. this type of thing and you know that's um that's that's not right or just so yeah there's i mean there's more recent examples yeah certainly than than you know <laughs> anyway this uh, definitely it'll change and it'll come to an end um, um it's how it comes to an end is how it affects all of us obviously well quite and, um i was on um gb news today um one of talking about the you know pm hopefuls and i mentioned that with rishi sunak we have the the danger of bringing in central bank digital currencies. And the, the presenter said, oh, what's that? And I was explaining, he said, uh, and I assume that's backed by gold. And I said, no, it's not backed by anything. You know, um, So there is an assumption, I think, by a lot of people that, well, I think a lot of people think that our money is backed by gold even now. But I think there is an assumption that, that whatever comes next will be backed by something. But that's not necessarily the case, is it? Um. I, I think there will have to be some some form of accountability. So when it's not backed by anything as fiat currency is, um, firstly, you get the generation that we're in charge and they went, we're really sorry about this, but we're not going to let you exchange our currency for gold anymore. Please forgive us. And they feel quite you know, uh, humble and all that. But after the next generation who didn't, weren't, didn't live with it and didn't go through that apology sort of uh, period, um, they're just thinking, look what we can do with this thing that's not anchored to anything. We can just print money and redistribute the wealth of the population. And, you know, theorists or whatever, they mistakenly think you can print wealth, which of course you can't do. You can't print value. You can print money if, if money is something like fiat currency. But yeah, we're just in a, you know, in a massive debt. Um, we, we had a massive debt problem globally back in 2007, 2008, which almost caused the, the system to grow into a hold. And to fix all that, they've added uh, a magnitude of more debt. So um, it's not like the system's straightened up. And um, yeah, CBDCs are a slightly different thing. I, I mean, I can speak about that, but it's a slightly different way of consuming a currency, which will then, because a currency is just a product, money is just a product. So a central bank is just a product provider and the, you know, the US Fed, their product is the US dollar, the Bank of England, their product is the pound. And if you consider it's just a product, um, then, you know, this was really uh, the basis of designing something like Tally. Um, why would we have a product that we all use every day that there's no competition for, so it's in effectively a monopoly, um, and, um, and it hasn't been innovated for five, five decades you know, there's no other industry like this. So just as a bit of background on me, five years ago, I started working on the concept of tally. And whilst five, 10 years ago, like, you know, there were a lot of people that would speak about these problems, but I didn't really want to speak about them until I had a solution that I could offer people because it can get a bit, you know, doom and gloomy. Mm. And we can do things to help ourselves. Um, and it's not about picking the biggest winner and what's going to have the most value in the next few years it's about getting the the biggest loser out of your out of your financial life and uh and that is why um just for those who don't know so we we created a standalone monetary system it works seamlessly with the fiat currency fractional reserve banking system but it protects you from that because our money uh, each tally represents your ownership of a milligram of gold that we vault on your behalf, that we don't own, that we don't leverage, don't meddle with. Um, and then through our tech and, you know, our banking app, uh, we're not a bank, but through our app that, you know, gives you an account with a sort code and IBAN and this type of thing, um, you can use the value of that for goods and services. So you can live in it just like money. I mean, it's designed to be, you know, our website's tally money. It's not tally gold. Um, but, but you need something that's anchoring, um, giving accountability to your monetary, to your money supply. And otherwise yeah, we could have... Yeah. Uh, sorry, I was just thinking, you know, accountability. If I could just bring Chris in here, um, because you you and um, Jason run in one place. And I know you have, you run meetings, you run webinars. 
with a lot of people who are very concerned about what's happening and what could happen to their money. What are you hearing, Chris, from the people who use your services? Why are people coming to see you um, and, and what, are they, what are they concerned about when it comes to their money? Yeah, thanks, Jasmine. I think the fundamental concern for most of the people that tend to come through our door is really comes down to the CBDCs. Um, and central bank digital currencies. Yeah, exactly. Central bank digital currencies and what that is going to mean for the average, you know, man and woman on the street. Um, everyone obviously has different amounts of, of finance available to them. And at the end of the day, £100 to someone is just as important as a million pounds to someone else. And the reality is, is that a lot of people are concerned about the uncertainty as to what's going to happen financially in the, in the markets over the, the, the coming sort of five to 10 years and what the implication of central bank digital currencies are going to mean. And for anyone on the call here that doesn't really know a huge amount about central bank digital currencies, they may know about crypto. But central bank digital currencies are essentially in, in a short uh, sort of quick and dirty um, explanation. Central bank digital currencies is basically a central bank, i.e. the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve in the US, a central bank controlled currency that is programmable. And within that programmable um, system, it allows the central bank to fundamentally top down control what happens with that central bank digital currency so they can say what you spend your money on you know you can spend it on in a ve vegetable shop but you can't spend it in a meat shop or and, can... and china did this recently china have obviously got the social credit score ongoing um, at the moment and with introducing their central bank digital currency they basically um gave the the, the citizens of the country the ability to download the wallet the central bank wallet and then basically said to them look we want you to we're going to give you x amount of central bank digital currency and you can go into these shops and spend it and they used it as a test run and the reality is because it's it's centrally controlled by the central bank and because it's completely programmable they can do whatever they like with it so if they decided that they didn't like you and you'd said something about the government that they didn't like they could effectively wipe this the actual currency from your wallet because again they control it and each um, central bank, you know, digital currency coin, as it were, um, is programmed and, and tokened. So if they decided to eradicate it, they could do. If they wanted to speed up the flow of money and try to increase GDP and basically say, well, um, we want to get money moving faster between person to person, this money that we're going to give you um, is essentially only going to be around in your wallet for the next month. And you can spend it in a month. If you don't spend it, it goes. And that ultimately is going to give them full top down control, which obviously is going to completely eradicate privacy from everyone's lives because they can track exactly how much you've got, where you're spending it, what you're spending it on. And that ultimately, for the majority of people that we talk to, what the, their primary concern is that and what is going to be happening to the banking system over the next, say, three to five years. Brilliant. And um, um, now I think we do have George. George, are you there? George Marr. <laughs> Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, can he? Oh, I can see you as well. How wonderful. Now I'm going to show again George's book, Punyari, which is um, uh, uh, the history of um, the uh, Russian, um, Russian Roman Empire um, that, from their economy. Now this, what we've been talking about, George, would be, you know, like spacemen coming from, from Mars to, to the, the Romans. But the same kind of thing was something similar was happening in that time, wasn't it, with, um, with the um devaluation of of roman coinage i'm 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 absolutely i'm um, um absolutely and i think it is um it, it's it's a marvelous lesson for us and it, it picks up on some of the the points that have been made uh, by the last two speakers i mean um uh, history repeating itself you know human nature doesn't change um they, they had a fractional um reserve banking system um and and also the point about control and um, you know, too, too often people look at the Roman Empire and they think of it as, as military and things, things like that. But actually, um, it transitioned from being a military empire to being a trading empire and vast amount of, uh, um, amounts of money moved around. I'm, I'm sitting in, in, um, in a building in London um, located at the edge of the old Roman city of London. And when this city was founded, um, people sitting in Rome lent money to people here. 
um, and one senior individual lent as much as 200 million. So, you know, these, these are big transactions and that's just, just one, one um, individual. And what, what that enabled, that beautiful um, uh, single currency across an area big, bigger than the EU, same coins um, flowing back and forth, what that enabled was a, um, a stupendous trading empire. Um, stuff uh, coming here in old Londinium uh, from, from Egypt, North Africa, uh, from uh, the Levant, uh, and, and from London back out, out to there. Um, but it all came, came crashing down, it seems. And it, it, all, Jasmine, it, all, it all came crashing down because they had built this absolutely wonderful, amazing system that everything depended on. Everything depended upon trust and recognition of the currency and of the banking system. And when I look at um, Roman ruins, and they're all over the place because they built towns all over the place, I'm looking at, so when I look at the Colosseum, that to me is a monument to economic incompetence. <laughs> they, smashed, they smashed their beautiful system that had taken centuries to build. And once they had smashed the economic system, they couldn't do the basics. They couldn't pay the soldiers. And when you can't pay the soldiers, you've got no borders and then people come and invade you. So to me, those ruined, beautiful buildings, like the Colosseum, they're monuments to economic failure, the, the failure to keep um, the currency and the banking system going. Well, now, Gordon, um, you know, I, you, you're probably fascinated listening to George speak because I know you, you love history. Do you think we are basically at the same point now, you know, where we, we saw the uh, the destruction of the Roman Empire, which George, I think, took took quite a few years once they started coin clipping, devaluing the coins. Absolutely. But, yes. How how many years did it take? Would you say for it to really crash? Um, so so around about around about um, one ninety, um, they are they are they're losing it. Round about one ninety A.D., they're losing the discipline. Uh, they are becoming very very complacent. Mm -hmm. But. Yeah. Um, AD 250, the thing is smashed. Yeah. And, it, and, and there is never again going to be a currency like that until the 18th century in England. Interesting. Yeah, so that's sort of 70 years, essentially. Gordon, do you, what, what do you think, what, where do you think we are at the moment? Because I know you have said, you, you, you've gone on record saying that you think that the euro is about to go. I mean, that's the, just the euro. But we've got the dollar. We've got, you know, um, as, as Cameron was saying, we're, we're, we're dealing with fiat. These are all fiat currencies. Um, and if they, if if one of these smashes, you know, falls, it's going to be a bit of a house of cards, isn't it? Unmute yourself, Gordon. I, uh, thanks, Jasmine. Yeah, yeah, I. I broadly agree with that. I would just urge a bit of caution with the, the verb we use. You know, I, don't, I no longer like using verbs like collapse or the euro will go or disappear. We, we're in an era of unparalleled political power by governments and they're perfectly capable of keeping the euro going in some way, shape or form for, for decades to come. But I think we're very, very close to the point in time where the euro will kind of trend off towards irrelevance, where the demand for holding euros is so weak, where there's, it's replaced by other things. And this is happening very quickly, even in the last month, because in chess parlance, the European Central Bank just made a major blunder. In its monthly meeting, around about June 8th or 9th, it made a major decision to talk about issuing forward guidance, not doing anything, but indicating that it's likely next move will be to increase interest rates. Now that was uh, immediately taken by the markets as an indication that it was now fine to bet against these uh, bombed out Southern European bonds, which the ECB have been buying in, in, in droves for the last kind of six, seven years. Spread differentials widened between Italy in particular and Germany. And within a week, the ECB was in panic mode. I've got a mole who attends the ECB meetings. And uh, he told me that, you know, they, they were completely flabbergasted at what, what, what would happen. And they decided, therefore, to invent some instrument you might have seen in the press called an anti-fragmentation instrument, which is obviously another version of money printing and, and, and buying assets, mainly of Italy, to try to suppress these spreads, Italy being regarded as a bellwether. But, it, you know, they've had a month since that, that meeting, June the 15th. It's not going to happen. I see in the chat, I just see on the phone, the Italian government is on the verge of collapse. 
The former president of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, is the prime minister, can't hold the camera together. And the reason is that the only way the ECB could get past the objections of Germany, Finland and the Netherlands in doing this dramatic bailout of Italy would be to abandon any pretense of not engaging in outright financing of member states and have a kind of conditionless bailout of Italy. Obviously, that, that wouldn't be accepted by them. So I think the proposal that was made in the last two weeks to Italy was, we will buy all your bonds, we'll restore these spreads to levels closer to Germany, but you'll have to agree to joining one of these kind of bailout programmes, which of course would be some kind of abdication of sovereignty in favour of the European Central Bank, IMF or whatever. And I think the government is just about to collapse in Italy because the Italians won't agree to that. Therefore, I think the demand for a replacement currency, which has some value in Europe, is very strong. I also note that Germany has recently repatriated all of its gold from the states and other places. Poland the same, Hungary the same. So I think that work is taking place behind closed doors on some alternative, which might end up looking something very similar to Cameron's tally. <laughs> that would be fun. So Cameron, um, has anybody from the Italian government uh, been in touch? Because it sounds like they all Well, um, uh, Andrew there, uh, he's just posted on the chat board that Mario Draghi has resigned from the Italian government. So this yeah. is why we're in, uh, you know, in our session oh, here. Yes, um, you heard it. Yeah. I'm not expecting Mario to be ringing. Um, the, um, yeah, I mean, if there is a reset, it would seem the reason why we use gold as an anchor is it's the obvious thing to use. It's very easily understood. It's it's very economic to store. It you know, has high value, and um, you're not you're not anchoring a currency value to a statistic like GDP, which statistics can be kind of manipulated. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I, I didn't set out with Tally from a gold point of view. I set out trying to design money after all I'd learned from being in the blockchain industry and, and really from studying Bitcoin and what came before Bitcoin and what Bitcoin was trying to achieve. Um, and I, I, it's, not, it's not like Bitcoin. We're not a cryptocurrency because I think there's some shortcomings there that, that really stop um, the potential for mass adoption yeah. from, from society. And you need a lot of people to feel comfortable using a new product that's come from the private sector um, and, uh, you know, for it to be effective. Otherwise, it'll, you know, just skirt around the edges. Um, but I think if governments, so this is the thing, if governments reset with, so first of all, to Gordon's point, I, I don't underestimate the amount of levers and pulleys that they can let this drag out for. Um, from a central banker's point of view, they want to get CBDCs out there because then they can remove cash from the system. Once they can remove cash from the system, apart from all the tracking and the invasion of privacy that Chris was referring to, they can do stupid economic theories like negative uh, going into negative interest rates. Now, in reality, of course, we're already in a negative interest rate here in the UK because the official rate is just over 1% and inflation is officially just over 9%. Yes. So the real interest rate is negative 8%. Mm -hmm. Like, which is to say, if I, uh, if I uh, you know, borrowed from you, Jasmine, a thousand pounds and use it for my own purposes and put it at risk, you, you should pay me 80 pounds for doing yes. that for your money. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's bizarre, mm -hmm. ridiculous stuff. And in fact, just while we're on how bizarre things are getting, and there is some hope here, by the way. We better make sure we leave some time to speak about solutions and mm -hmm. know that, right. that, that our world's not just completely falling apart. Mm -hmm. um, because that's another beautiful thing about human nature, our ability to adapt. Uh, to adapt. Yeah. So, um, but um, yeah, just, I mean, there's, there's um, a paper put out by the FCA now where they're, um, and they've got an 11 million pound budget to target and communicate to the 8.6 million people in the UK who hold more than £10,000 in their bank account because um, to try and get them into investments, safe investments, like they don't want them getting speculative ones too much, um, but because basically, if you read between the lines, because having more than 10000 in your bank account is not the safest place to be anymore. Absolutely. Now, um, RG, uh, yes, RG has said, um, you're talking about the banking system crashing, failing uh, potentially, and fiat becoming worthless um, or worthless potentially. Governments collapsing, it's happening, so it's no longer a conspiracy. Absolutely, um, conspiracy, by the way, is um, the, the, the the truth. Just um, six months later um, than you thought it was. Um, 
so is uh, is this where crypto comes in um yeah the banks governments will want to stop the control of this but can they um i'll just bring chris in on this because chris you 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 and jason you've created um, a currency that's actually silver backed but it's a cryptocurrency is that right uh, well, we, we well, I can't take any credit for this. This is all Jason's doing, but um, we basically created two things. So one, we've actually created a silver-backed cash currency. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I say, I, I say, created. It's it's currently being finalised and printed and all the rest of it. But effectively, we have a, a silver-backed cash currency that is going to be available in a number of weeks. Um, but we also have a digital wallet called Digit All. So digital. Um, that basically has, in essence, 25 different stores of value programmed into it. So whether that's gold, silver, um, oil, cryptocurrencies, G7 currencies, um, stock indexes, whatever it is that your personal you know, um, weighting is towards that. And basically, we provide through digital a digital representation of the physical product. So um, if you, for example, decide to have silver or oil, um, digital provides a digital representation of that that you can effectively go and spend in the shops or save. So if you want to go into, um, you know, Sainsbury's or Wish or Tesco's or whoever your chosen supermarket is and buy your weekly shop, then you can pay for your weekly shop with your barrel of oil via the digital representation of, of that. Um, and if for whatever reason they don't accept it like a, an Apple Pay type device, then we've got a debit card that goes along with that and is a prepaid one that then draws the the finances down from the wallet so in terms of um i suppose what you're alluding to in terms of solutions and you know it sounds like cameron's also on board with those sorts of ideas mm -hmm. of what he's doing at, at tally which is which is fantastic the the good thing about human beings is that we have endeavor and that we will try to one way or another work around mm. these problems and to what you were saying this is really for anyone that's doubting this is really is not conspiracy theory um a guy called augustin carstens who's the uh, general manager of the bank of international settlements um was involved in a, a conference i think it was um, mid-october in 2020 and basically said that the central banks will have absolute control over the rules and regulations governing CBDCs yeah. and have the technology to enforce them because essentially they don't know who's carrying cash. This is not conspiracy theory. This is happening and it's coming. And we obviously have a little bit of time to adapt um, and people like ourselves are in one place and what Cameron's doing at Tally Money, we're, we're providing those solutions and all being well, providing people with options of how they can utilise and save and and well, exactly. avoid the, the central bank digital currencies and all the, the, the privacy ripping away from you as, as they seem to be doing. Yeah, exactly. Well, this, this is something I've been thinking over the, over the last few weeks that if, if the, our government and other governments do force CBDC, CBDCs on us, there will be people, and I will be at the forefront, who will come up with alternatives um, and just, you know, put two fingers up at the system and go, no, we've, we've got this. And Cameron, I think you'll have to be at the front uh, because already you are paying your, your staff in gold. Is that right? Well, some of them we contract in our currency. Why wouldn't we? We believe in it far more than the pound. And um, I get, I've been, I was the first. I mean, it'd be weird if I didn't believe in it. But um, uh, no, I mean, it's great. I don't really worry about <laughs> you know, I don't really worry about inflation and stuff because I know generally I'll always be better off because I'm in a currency that's uh, that that's not devalued by design. I mean that's a, that's a good starting point. As I say, I mean look with what um you know and what what Chris has uh, got a uh, team of providing there. You know we need choices. Like we need to have some options. One thing about that I was really focused on keeping very simple with Tally is um people generally right don't think about the concept of money when they use money like it's so omnipresent in their lives and it, it's almost like where you wear glasses you don't really see the lens because you're just seeing the world and you know but you know you know a lens is there but you don't really see what that lens is made of and um and frankly you know i, I mean this goes to cbdc's and also uh, some forms of digital banking um yeah, a lot of us kind of want to simplify things we want something we can just rely on know that it's going to maintain its buying power, know that nobody's meddling with it or putting it at risk. Um, and I can just go on and be more productive in my life. And that's how I can build wealth for my, myself and my family. 
Um, and this shouldn't be such an extraordinary environment to create, but unfortunately, the banking system is a lending system. It works to the detriment of savers and depositors. So that was, um, that was what I was trying to fix, basically, to have a healthy environment, to be a saver and a depositor. Um, and, and we've achieved that with Tally. It's, you know, maybe it's not for everyone, but, but the one thing I would say, um, it, well, there's, there's a couple of things, but, but one thing generally, you can't rely on someone else to kind of protect your family's finances for you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can appreciate people don't want to start becoming stock market experts and all this type of thing and doing this on the weekend after they've done their job all week. I mean, instead of spending time with their family, which they're now earned to do, you know, because you can't sit there and just look at your money savings in a bank account because that's just working against you, which is, again, it's a ridiculous situation, but this is why we have these kind of solutions. Um, but, yeah, you know, you want to be self-resilient and, and empowered in your life. And um, and that's what these, uh, you know, certainly Tally was designed to deliver for people. It's it's a positive experience. It's not a doom and gloom scenario. You're actually free from it. You can sleep better at night. You know that over time... It, it's it's you know it goes up a multiple against fiat currency but what really is going on is fiat currency is being devalued by design whereas something like gold is is effectively just maintaining its purchasing power um so yeah. you know again people i mean if people really wanted to think about what they're using as money deeply is another thing they have to worry about in their lives um that we'd already be marching in the street about this it'd yeah. be ridiculous so you just want to use something that you can trust, rely on. You know that the system that's set up is um, protects you. And what you know, you're the one who earned the money. Why is anybody else messing around with it? Well, true. So, and uh, George, I'm going to come back to you because um, I remember George um, when when um, you and I spoke um, recently. Um, you were mentioning that uh, the you feel that the only type of solid currency is one that is centralized. Am I right in saying that? Um, I, uh, I, I, yeah, I, I think I think so to an to an to an extent. I mean, what the what the Romans did, um, which was part of the genius, was they completely centralised control of the currency, um, and they eliminated all competing currencies. So the currency that had existed in ancient Greece uh, before they invaded was eliminated. Um, their gold and silver uh, coins circulate there, and it's it's a unified uh, banking system. Um, and, and that gave them that, that gave them a lot of stability, um, but the, the 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 difficulty the difficulty of that was when their system collapsed. There was no alternative. There was there was no uh, new currency that could re replace it that had been nurtured in some other part of the system. There were no other currencies, um, and I I think um, that one of the um, difficulties that we have nowadays, which is why this conversation is is in so many ways so very very important, is is that we actually do only have one currency. The way I look at it is um, the the world currency is the dollar. There's a and the the whole system is critically dependent upon that. Um, you know, we have subsidiary currencies like like sterling, the euro, and all the rest. But when uh, when things start to get difficult, there is a flight to the dollar, and that's what everyone trusts. Um, and it's like it's like uh, flying uh, a plane with just one engine. You know, it might be very efficient in some way, but if that engine goes, the whole thing goes. Um, and, and that's why I've, I've found this discussion so, so very fascinating, because it's, it's showing that, um, you know, people um, have a great awareness of the danger of being so critically dependent on one part of a system. And it's just so lovely, um, you know, to, to hear of the innovation um, that's happening. And the more of this innovation that, that happens, which is, which is beautiful to see in its own right, the safer we will be. And the more people say, you can't have a plane with just one engine, mm -hmm. you know? True. Well, um, some people are saying that we may be going into a bipolar um, global system where you have the, the dollar on one side, and then you have ruble and renminbi on the other, potentially. What do you think of that? I, I think state money is state money, um, and uh, it's state money. And what I find uh, fascinating about the uh, some of the developments that I see is it is the emergence of private money. Um, and... Um, so, so when you say the, the ruble or whatever, um, 
I think the dollar, this is just an opinion, I think the dollar will win against those. Mm -hmm. But if something like tally money, and it, that, that could, would be where the thing is. Yes. Well, um, Gordon, you deal a lot with Eastern Europe, I know. Um, now, from, from what um, George says, do you feel um, also that, that really the, the dollar is all powerful and will continue to be, even though it's been so massively devalued? Or do you, do you see the ruble with its sort of asset backed, gold backed, largely gold and asset backed status as actually being a, a genuine contender? Well, I, th I think the ruble is a, a genuinely uh, impressive currency. I mean, it's doubled in value since the outbreak of the war. Um, it's obviously regarded as a commodity backed currency. Um, uh, I've even actually pitched in Moscow to talk about designing a, a kind of gold based uh, money system, but they seem to have kind of moved ahead fairly quickly with it. They're also developing closer trading relationships with Russia. I, I see they're, they're um, generating substantial oil sales and gas to, you know, east of Russia to, to kind of replace the revenue that they're missing in, in Europe. So I don't think there's any question that we are in a, as you put it, Jasmine, a kind of bi or tripolar polar world where you know, the war has kind of crystallized trading relationships as, in some kind of east-west divide. There's also major countries like uh, Turkey and Pakistan fully refusing to impose any sanctions whatsoever. Your specific question was on Eastern Europe. The most interesting thing geopolitically wise in Eastern Europe, which has actually been turbocharged by the Ukraine war, is the development of the Three Seas Initiative. This is effectively the 12 easternmost countries running more or less north to south uh, member states of the EU from the, the three Baltic states, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, down to Greece, which is considering joining being 13th. All of these countries with the notable outlier of Austria are regarded as the kind of economically poorest countries mm -hmm. in, in the EU. Although this, this initiative started with a couple of them back in 2015, nothing has really happened until the last six to nine months. The purpose behind these 12 countries forming this unit is effectively to kind of recognizing that they've been dealt a bit of a raw deal by the EU, which I think this is not Brexit related at all, but I think the EU is basically operates to the financial economic advantage of France in particular, kind of leaving the status quo more or less unaffected. You know, the, the wages of a certain 30 year old qualified farm worker in France, I think about two, two and a half thousand euros a month, similar worker in Bulgaria, 300 euros a month. And the Eastern European countries have now formed this kind of political block to really access financial markets and demand some of these bailout funds together. And yes, there are discussions, I believe, taking place on this subject of optimal currency area. I don't think they've gained much ground. I think most of the East European countries that I have contact with just think that the best tactic for them in this euro, the currency euro crisis, which is clearly unfolding before us, is to grab onto Germany's coattails and do whatever Germany leads with. So I think they're gonna stay very Western focused, but unless Germany recognizes the intense fragility of its own and other European banking systems, then whatever currency it comes up with is going to have problems within a year or three anyway. Well, interestingly, Andrew Bevan has said here that the BRICS countries are trying to form a currency. So that's Brazil, Russia, Indonesia, China, South Africa. Um, so, yeah, that well, Andrew, that's that's an interesting one. I, I'd be very interested to see what, what they come up with. So we're coming towards the end um, of the hour. Um, we're going to give ourselves a bit, little bit more time because we started late. But um, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about the, the problems of currency, the pro problems particularly of fiat money, pounds, dollars, euros. Um, and we've, we've touched on some solutions because, because we did say, you know, how can people protect their wealth? Where do they put their money? You know, bonds seem to be hopeless. Property, maybe. Uh, commodities seem to be fairly strong. Stock markets, who knows? Um, but so I'm, I wonder if, if all four of you can give me your thoughts on what people should do. People who have, as you've said, Chris, a small amount or a large amount, depending on, you know, it's, we're all, we all have different amounts that, that feel like wealth to us. I, in fact, I'm going to start with you, Chris. Chris, what, what do you feel um, people should do, ordinary people with 
life savings, what they, should they be doing with it at the moment to protect it? I think, yeah, just two seconds before I get on to the, that, uh, just to say, I don't know how, I, how what people think on this, but the dollar is dying. The dollar is going to go soon. I mean, in in, in late um, in in late twenty um, late twenty twenty, um, sorry, in January twenty twenty, they had about four trillion dollars in circulation. By the end of twenty twenty one, they had twenty trillion in circulation. They printed so much money that the dollar is is dying very rapidly. And the reality is is that. That countries can't afford to pay their dollar denominated debt anymore which is just going to push up if you look at the dxy the, the rating of the the us dollar against other currencies it's going through the roof the, the dollar won't be the reserve currency for much longer so just as as for something for people to look at brent johnson's dollar milkshake theory worth looking at in terms of a in terms of looking at the, the dollar but in terms of what you were saying there what people should be doing i think get every penny that you've got out of the, the high street banks uh, because they're broken. Um, JP Morgan, as of 2019, had 200, were leveraged to the tune of 216,000% on the remaining cash deposits that they've got. So the remaining cash that they've got in their bank, they were leveraged 216,000% on it. And that goes for pretty much every high street bank. They're leveraged to the eyeballs and they basically don't have the cash deposits to pay off um, their, you know, the, the derivatives that they've spent into the market should the market collapse. The reality is, is that when the economy goes, the banks are going to be performing bail-ins left, right and centre. Um, so I personally, I mean, we, we have our own um, financial reserve called Sense Reserve, which is uh, an offshore uh, banking structure. We're encouraging everyone to get their finances out of the high street banks and get it into things like gold and silver, commodities, um, oil, natural gas, copper, wheat. All of these sorts of things are likely to do well over the coming years. Um, so getting, getting finances out of fiat currency and into something physical is a very, very sensible thing to do because the reality is fiat currency in its current form is not going to be around for that much longer. CBDCs come in in 2024 in G7 countries. If you look at um, Nigeria and Jamaica in the last two years, in the last two weeks, they've launched their CBDCs already. Mm -hmm. Fiat currency is going to go. Um, and as a result, you do not want to be the last one left on the merry-go-round when the merry-go-round stops. Yeah. You've got time to get you know, finances into these commodities. And Cameron sounds like they've put together a really, really good product to allow that. We've done a, a not too dissimilar thing with digital. There are these options out there that you can start to get used to transacting in a digital fashion, but using physical commodities to either save or to spend. Yeah. So we're, we're advocating people if they've got money in their or currency in their bank accounts to get it out of that and to start really thinking about as, as terrible as it sounds, a bit of disaster planning, having, having cash at home, you need to pay your essential bills. If the ATM stops spewing out the, the, the money, um, having silver, you know, silver is probably the number one most undervalued asset cl class on the planet right now. Um, in the 19, mid 1970s, you could get a, a silver, a one ounce of silver was about 50 odd dollars. It's now about 25. So mm -hmm. there, there are very few things that you can now get at the moment in terms of commodity based assets that are half the price of what they were in the 70s. True. So do your research, look at the different things, but certainly gold, silver, oil, natural gas, copper, wheat, they're some of the, the good ones. Even just looking forward to the, the way the world is going, the world is going far more towards you know, batteries. So what are the types of metals, the conductive metals that are used in batteries? Silver being one of them, cobalt, um, when the, the car batteries go to solid state batteries, which they're going to be doing, that use a heck of a lot of lithium, you know, buy into these things because the world is going to need it. So invest in, the, in, the, in the, the things of the future that the world is essentially going to need because the price is going to go up. And as Cameron said, you want to invest in things that are going to hold its value because it's not that these things are going up. It's just the cash that you're buying it with is devaluing. And that's why the price essentially goes up. Good point. Cameron, um, how, what would you add to that? Um, well, just for everybody's, um, uh, you know, just to be clear, when uh, when Chris mentions a bail-in, he's not talking about a bail-out. So after the global financial crisis, um, regulators or uh, um, uh, yeah, yeah, regulators basically got together and said, 
Um, we're not going to have enough to bail out from tax revenues, from, from um, tax that, that we all pay to bail out banks from the government. So we need to give them authority with the regulators to let individual banks uh, expropriate or seize the parts of your depositors' funds. Yeah. So when these banks get in trouble, so if, if you're with, I'm not casting any aspersions on particular banks, but if Lloyds were in trouble and, and I had my money with Barclays, but, but Jasmine, if you were with Lloyds or something um, and we had 10,000 in there each and they get in trouble, they can do a, a, a bail-in and uh, expropriate, seize, say, 40% of your deposit. I'm still okay with mine because my individual banks held together. And they've tried to take a view or justify that a depositor is um, a stakeholder in that organisation, which is absolute rubbish. A shareholder is a stakeholder in that organisation. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's generating returns and all that. But this is not the understanding of people, you know, using a bank or a banking system. Um, the um, the name of this uh, directive is the bank uh, bank what is it? Bank Recovery and Resolution Directive Number Two. Uh, it's Directive Number Two since we came out of the EU. Um, it's a real thing. It's a threat. When when the system goes, um, there will be a, a domino effect, and and this is going to be a problem for all of us. Um, that said, I you know I don't want a catastrophe to happen. I think central bankers. I, I mean, you can have an argument whether central bankers need to exist, but um, uh, I think a, a country should have its own currency, uh, but it needs to be trusted. And really, to trust something, it needs to be transparent and it needs to be accountable to something. So um, I also, uh, you know, I agree with Chris. The US dollar has got a unique uh, operational functional value more so than the other, um, the other fiat currencies uh, as George was kind of identifying, but, um, but it will go as well because there's nothing behind it. I mean, it's just structurally, it's a, it's a flawed product. So they will reset with a, a, a product to hopefully win our confidence and that we can trust people again, basically politicians and central bankers that they won't do this to us again, but they always do it. It is historically, it just gets repeated, this debasing of government issued currency. So, so I think, yeah, so the hope is, and certainly when I say hope, the, um, the option we have, firstly, uh, if you've got some excess money and you like investing and you like a particular thing, or if you like following markets, I mean, you know, good luck to you. I, I own some stocks, so, you know, I, I, I have a property, um, but I need money. I need money every day in my daily life. I need money because I need a buffer for a rainy day, for life's uncertainties. I know that it's not intelligent just to live on credit, so I need to save up for a holiday. I've got my kids' education, but I need money. So what, what does money actually have to be for me? It has to be reliable. It has to be my in my control. I have to have access to it whenever I want immediately. I need everybody to accept it. I don't want to have to go to a venue and convince them to accept some weird uh, other currency. Um, so that's really what we were trying to design with Tally. It is true that it's your money is, is gold, like it's a digital representation of the gold. It's not a cryptocurrency or anything. That is your legal title. Our technology allows you to use the value of that and move it around um, as money and you can live in it. And uh, I mean, I you know, I do. I, I don't. I don't have trouble sleeping at night. I also have other investments because I'm, you know, financially interested in stuff. But um, as far as money goes, I still, by the way, I still have, um, I still have a couple of direct debits in my Barclays account. I don't mind having a little bit of fiat money. It's not my main money. Um, and and we're not trying to burn down the Bank of England or anything. But they need to fix their products. It's terrible for society. It has societal implications between the haves and the have not, all sorts of terrible stuff. And the US dollar, when that falls, and it will, um, that'll be the biggest one of all because um, that's, in a way, that's the biggest, I hate to say this, it doesn't sound very good, but it's like the biggest con out of all of them. Um, yeah. So, so look, it's, so here's the thing. The solution will come from the private sector and it won't just be one solution. Bitcoin really carved a path of what's possible regulators had to deal with it in a way that they couldn't pressure an individual to shut it down until they figured it out because, uh, it, you know, Satoshi Nakamoto didn't identify him or her or themselves. Um, and so it tested a lot of things around, um, well, it showed a path of how to do certain things in technology. Uh, we don't use these, we are a centralised organisation, so we don't use decentralised technology or distributed ledgers um, because we need to have the gold in our vaults in Switzerland before we can issue tally. So it's not created through an algorithm or anything. Um, but 
you know, it showed that the private sector is really where this is at. You can't wait for the state. I mean, governments, they're not, they're not the entrepreneurs. They're not coming up with the solutions for tomorrow or, or the solutions we need today. The private sector will do that. Um, Tally's there. It sounds like uh, in one place, which I apologise, Chris, but I haven't actually heard of before we started talking today, but uh, I'll be checking that out. It sounds interesting. Um, you know, for me, I just want something simple that I can rely on because when I want to invest, I can I can do that. Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, you've, you've got to, at the end of the day, you've got to be self-reliant, self-resilient. It's not because you want to isolate, but if you want to, if you want to be part of a community, if you want to help others, you've got to get yourself in a position of strength first and people rely on you to get your house in order. And you and need to get your house in order. Said, sorry, Jasmine, just to follow yeah. up on what Cameron said in regards to bail-ins for everyone that's, that's listening, when you put money into the bank, the money legally becomes theirs which is something that not a lot of people realise. So mm -hmm. they can legally take it under a bail-in and use it to prop themselves up. So <laughs> please do have a look at what Professor, Professor Richard Werner has done on, on this and the empirical study that he'd done, just for everyone listening. But Cameron is entirely right. If you put money in the bank, it legally becomes theirs. So they are legally entitled to take it, should they need And this did happen in, um, in Cyprus. In Cyprus in 2014, yeah. yeah. So just, so. just one last thing, because everyone will understand this. Um, you're lending your money to the bank. They're taking the asset, as Chris is saying. They have an obligation back to you. A bank customer is a bank creditor. It's a lending system. You know you've lent it to them. Why? Because they pay interest. Interest is a return paid on a loan, like whichever direction the loan goes, but that is the return on a loan. That's why you get interest in your savings account. And Paul Randolphy has said, uh, but the government does guarantee £85,000. Um, it, it does. Um, my concern, though, um, and I'll, I'll come to Gordon on this, my concern is that if all the banks failed, surely the government wouldn't have the money to cover all of that. They will print a truckload, and by the time you get your 85000 back, it'll be worth about forty five. Yeah. <laughs> and also, it, you're meant to get this under that scheme. Sorry, Gordon, because I know you know, yeah. Jasmine asked you the answer, but under this scheme, you're meant to get paid out within seven days of a bank going into administration. But they don't go into administration quickly, even when they restrict your access to your money. So when Northern Rock had a run on the bank a few years back or over a decade ago now, it was four months before it got uh, reconstructed, which means you would have been without access to your money or have limited access to whatever the bank and the regulator suggest you, you should be able to live on, regardless of your mortgage and whatever. Um, and then you would have got your money back. But if it's happening across the board, you know, the financial services conversation scheme isn't sitting there with all this money. It will need to be created, digitally created. Um, Venetia, I know, um, Venetia's a friend of mine, and, and I know we've, we've spoken about this before, Venetia. She says, um, can you put your pension pot into alternative currencies? What do you think, um, uh, Cameron? Can you do uh, Some of them you can. It depends if it's your SIP and uh, whether it's approved by their committee. Um, something like physical allocated gold that um, you can do with Tally, we're exploring this because you do have um, allocated gold, it's tied to a particular allocated bar, but because you can move it in real time, whether that you know, is a bit too dynamic for their understanding. Yeah. So we just haven't, haven't had those conversations, but you can do um, in, in some products, not, not too many, but things like gold you can. Yeah, yeah you get that converted idea. into a into a um, as Cameron said a SIP, which is a self invested personal pension. That that will give you the architecture and the flexibility to invest it as you want. It just depends on whether your provider will allow that. So sorry, Gordon, for car crashing your. Uh... <laughs> Gordon, Chris, do we even need Gordon here? We'll just keep talking amongst ourselves. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Gordon. I, I think I think some of the discussion is getting a bit too close for my comfort level onto giving investment advice to the attendees. I, I, I'm not in that business. I just operate at the 30,000 feet level in terms of trying to predict the next phase in this general debasement of fiat money. So I, I don't disagree with the, the general comments criticizing the dollar <clears throat> or sterling, but let's bear in mind that Japan has announced the most dramatic policy in the last three months. The Japanese central bank has announced that they will finance literally unlimited amounts of Japanese government debt at a fixed interest cost of 0.25%. So they've basically declared circularity of financing, which one would have thought in any previous era of capitalism would have kind of crashed the currency, but it hasn't. The Japanese yen is still accepted as a system of money. So I'm a little bit wary about 
making you know really really dramatic doomsday predictions about the collapse of the Swiss franc or the yen or the dollar you know in the foreseeable future the currency that I continue to focus on that I believe is the one which is most likely to suffer significant disruption is the euro mm. the euro lacks any form of governmental authority it's just an agglomeration of 23 present member states with the possibility of Croatia joining in January and Bulgaria the following year if there's if the the, the present disruption serious turmoil which has gripped the euro even in the last three weeks they'll try everything i'll try it fast they, they, they there's nothing these eurocrats won't do they will try cbdc's i think they'll fail i think i think there will be a kind of split there will be new optimal currency areas germany will take some kind of lead and i think we'll see a rapid denouement of all these kind of fears that have been uh put, put in front of us as you know jasmine i have spent a great deal of time in trying to contact parliamentarians and broadcast my fears about CBDCs. But I think for those reasons, in this very difficult game of making predictions, I think the CBDC will be experimented with. And much like COVID permanent lockdowns, in Europe it will kind of be rejected first. And hopefully that will help us to see the light. And all of these insane policies, which have become uh, uh, the, the, the kind of addiction of our governments, such as extreme woke policies, banning the car, net zero, all of these, there'll be a kind of reset to the thinking about that. So mm. hopefully, hopefully this, 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 this lunatic drive into ultra polluting batteries will be at an end and there'll be some restoration of common sense and preservation of petrol cars for, 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 for the foreseeable future. That's a, that's a whole other, other subject that we haven't got time to go into, sadly. Um, now, Boran Udin has said, um, so how much, what percentage of our wealth should we keep in the bank? and keep the rest in you know, investments and things. Um, now, of course, you know, again, thank you, Gordon, for reminding me that nothing here can be taken as financial advice. Um, but, you know, it's uh, not a bad thing to, to be thinking about. You know, everybody has different percentages. Um, when people ask me about um, how much, what percentage of, of your investments should be in cryptocurrency, I say no more than 1%. That's what I say um, with, um, I mean, I personally agree with Cameron that, that you know, you have enough in the bank to sort of cope with your day to day transactions, but no more. Um, and yes, Chris is, is nodding on this one. I'd like to just finish, um, I think, particularly with with George, because George, you've been patiently waiting there. Um, what now with your um, historian's hat on, knowing what you know about um, the, the Roman Empire? Um, what would your um, what are your thoughts for people who want to protect their wealth? What do you think works from looking at history, George? Oh, um, I, I, also, I also have an actuarial hat. Um, oh. I, 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 um, and, and, and you, and, and coming at it from both angles, I just, and, and briefly, um, I, I think uh, that one of the positives that happened out of the uh, crisis of 2008, 2009, when the world financial system came close to collapse and it was inches away uh, from the cliff edge, is, is that um, people in the system did actually learn. And one of the amazing things that happened in the United Kingdom and in some other places uh, was the ring fencing that happened within, within the banks. And one of the deputy governors of the Bank of England uh, said something extraordinary um, a few years ago, which was that he would fight um, to the last drop of blood to protect ring fencing because it is so crucially important. And what, what happened was the systemically important banks, such as Lloyd's, Barclays, and all the rest, had their retail business carved out. And no gambling stuff, if I may use the shorthand, can go into those ring-fenced parts of the bank. Um, and and, and that, that is crucial. It means that the state can actually protect them. Um, and if they were to collapse, and the state were not to protect them, then that would be the end of the state. Mm. Um, so um, my money that is with uh, Lloyd's, I have absolutely um, no um, concerns whatsoever about the security of it. When I want it back, I will get it back. Um, it, it will depreciate. So we will have 10% knocked off at this year and 10% in my view next year. And that's not good. But in terms of security, I have, I have no concerns about it. Um, it you, you asked the question initially about um, where, would, where would I put my money? Uh, and where do I put my money? And, um, you know, I, I put it in, um, uh, you know, a part of the world that I think is going to survive. Um, and I think, you know, we're kind of all in this together. 
if if the dollar collapses, everything collapses. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just for them, it's for us. Um, if the US collapses, everything collapses. You know, where's NATO then? Um, so a chunk of, um, you know, I, I would put a chunk into the United States. So the handy thing about the United States compared to say Russia or China is if you got money there and you want it back tomorrow, you can get it back tomorrow. They don't, there's no risk of them having, hanging on to it. And I kind of like the S&P, the Standard & Poor's 500 index, because if you ever look at those 500 companies and, you know, you can just flick it over the pages, you're looking at the US economy. Amazon, yeah, I recognize that. Uh, Walmart, I know about that. McDonald's, don't want to go there, but I know about that. So having money in the Standard & Poor's 500, um, you're investing in the US economy in a way that you can understand their institutions, although you can complain about them, continue to be robust. They're innovative. They'll continue to want to grow the country economically. And as someone once said, they run their country for the stock exchange. You know, why shouldn't I have a share of it? So that, <laughs> that's, that's my question. And um, it maybe, it's, maybe it's informed by, you know, looking at that wonderful story of people who built up something and smashed it. Um, and then looking at the Americans today and they built up something and they could smash it, but I don't think they're doing it now. It, it, they're not at that part of the cycle. My personal view. Yeah, I know, I know that, that Gordon, Chris and Cameron will have a very different sense of things but, for that, but we're actually at the end of our hour now. So, so um, I have to say to everybody, come along to the next one uh, because we will be having more of these webinars as things unfold, as things change, we will be looking and, and looking at what is happening with currency, with, with money, with the economic situation, with the financial system over the next sort of year and, and more. So thank you so much for everyone. As I said before, nothing today should be taken as financial advice. Thank you so much to Cameron Parry from Tally Money. So that's T-A-L-L-Y, Tally Money. Dot com. Do go and have a look. Uh, we've written uh, a few uh, times about tally money on moneymagpie.com. So have a look on Money Magpie as well if you want to find out more about what it does. Um, thank you very much to Chris Lewis from inoneplace.com, also worth a look at. Gordon Kerr from Cobden Partners and George Ma, author of Punyari, here is my own book, which, it probably, uh, which is not signed, George. So next time we meet, I must get you to sign it. Thank you so much. This whole thing is being recorded. It will be put on the uh, moneymagpie.com website on Monday. So do come back and make sure you join the next one. Thank you so much to everyone.